Hi, uh, this is day two, uh, and uh, hopefully it seems to be getting a lot easier for me. Hopefully it's getting a lot easier for you guys. Um, uh, Freddie, the next set, uh, session of your homework, uh, Mrs. Marzinski sent out in your packet, in your packet, that she wants you to make a chart or a tool to organize problems in your story. Uh, she want, What she wants you to do is set up like a problem. I did mine um, as like a diagram of, I put the, a problem, the word problem at the top, and then I had thought of three different problems that could be happening in the story. The first one is Voldemort. Um, is he still around? You know, he killed his, he killed Harry's family and he supposedly had um, lost his powers or might have even died. We're not too sure yet what's going on in the story. So is he still around? Will he try to hurt Harry again? Um, and I really feel that this one is important to the plot of the story. The plot means how things evolved and how everything gets carried along throughout the story. Um, also, one other thing that I was thinking was, uh, another problem was, he, he doesn't really know who he is. He doesn't have a clue that he's a wizard. Um, why are some weird things happening to him? Um, that he can't explain, like the bow constrictor just getting up and um, the glass of the bow constrictor, constrictor's cage disappearing and him being able to just slither out. Um, or how does his hair grow back overnight when his aunt had cut it off short? Um, and, you know, I think that that was important to his character. Because that, um, think about how confused you would be if you had no idea that you were actually a wizard or who you actually were. You know, he doesn't really know that he had hit what his parents did, um, who they were. He has no other relatives other than the Darsley, a Darsleys. Um, and that brings me to my third problem. You know, look at the way that they treated him. You know, if they're always constantly yelling at him, not treating him the same as if he was their son or nephew, treating him in a good way. Think about how you would grow up um, if you didn't have somebody who loved you and supported you and everything that you did. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering, is this the end? You know, once he moves on to Hogwarts, are we going to actually see them again? Are they going to be part of the story later on? So that's one of the reasons why I'm not too sure if I put them as the most important, because I don't know if I'm going to see them again. Um, and I also think that I put it at the, but that they are important to the character of the story. You know, character is the character, um, like Harry, Harry is the main character, but these are all, um, the Darsleys are all supporting characters, that they are part of the story, but they're not the most important part. They're there, they're supporting um, Harry. They're actually showing, you know, they appear every once in a while. They're not gonna necessarily appear all the time. So that's why they're just the supporting characters. Um, but they also are part of how they, they tell us, um, why Harry is the way he is. He, you know, they're the ones that hid what he was to everybody, to, to Harry. You know, they're the one, they knew that Harry was a wizard, but they were not, they were trying to stomp it out. They didn't want him to even know that. They were hoping that if they never told him about it, that he wouldn't be a wizard. Um, the second thing that you were supposed to do is just to write a short sentence or two about why you chose the um, main problem as being the most important. And once again, I chose Voldemort as being the um, problem. And what I wrote, and um, 
This is what this is what I wrote. And I wrote, I feel that Voldemort is the most important problem in the story. Voldemort killed Harry's parents, and nobody knows if he's still around. Um, and actually, that's, I'm going to give you that as a sentence starter. You can write, I'm going to erase this and just allow you to use what you think would be the most important. And then you can just work off of this here sentence. And then if you can just come up with one more sentence, um, that'd be great. All right, let me start reading again. Now we're on chapter five and um, we're just at, Hagard came and um, he's uh, planning on taking Harry back to Hogwarts um, and they need to get all sorts of things uh, set up for him to go to Hogwarts. And um, they're still on the island and we'll end up seeing exactly where he ends up going from here. I'm not exactly too sure myself. Harry woke up early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. A dream, a, he dreamed a giant Hagard. Hagard came to tell me I was going to school for wizards. When his eyes, when I open my eyes, I'll be at home in my cupboard. There, there was suddenly a loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia uh, knocking on the door. Harry thought his heart sink, sinking. He still did open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry muttered. I'm getting up. He sat up and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off of him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa and there was an owl tapping, wrapping his claw on the window, a newspaper held in its beak. Harry scrambled to his feet, so happy he felt as though a large balloon was swelling inside of him. He went straight to the window and jarred it open. The owl swooped in and dropped the newspaper on top of Hagar, who um, didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered into the onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. Don't do that! Harry tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it uh, snapped its beak fiercely at him and, car uh, and carried on scavenging the coat. Hagrid said Harry loud, loud, loudly, "There's an owl. Pay him." Hagrid grunted in, into the sofa. What? He's wanting pain for delivering the paper. Look in the pockets. Hagrid's coat sent, uh, seemed to be made of nothing but pockets, bunched, uh, bunches of keys, slug pellets, balls of string, peppermint, humbugs, tea bags. Finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange looking coins. Give him five canuts said Hagrid slow, sleepily. Canuts? The little brown, brown ones. Harry counted out five little brown coins and the owl kept held out his legs so Harry could put the money into a small leather pouch tied to it. Then he fell off, then he flew off through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly, sat up and stretched. Best be off, Harry. Um, lots to do, to do today. Got to go to London and buy all your stuff for school. Harry was uh, turning over the wizard's corns and looking at them. He had just thought of something that made him feel as though the happy balloon inside him had, um, had gotten punctured. Huh? Hagard? Hmm, said Hagard. 
who was pulling on who was pulling on his huge boots. I haven't got any money. And you heard Harry, uh, Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go and learn magic. Don't worry about that, said Hagard, standing up and uh, scratching his head. Do you think your parents didn't leave you something, anything? But if their house has been destroyed, they didn't keep their gold in the house, boy. Nah, first stop for us is um, Grinton's Wizard's Bank. Have a, have a sausage. They're not bad cold. And I wouldn't say uh, no to a bit of ha a birthday cake either. Wizards have banks? Just the one. Uh, Gringert's run of a goblin, by goblins. He, dro he dropped a bit of a sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah. So you'd be mad to try to rob it. I'll tell you that. Uh, never met, uh, never mess with goblins. Harry, uh, Gringart's is the safest place in the world for anything you want to be kept safe. Kept, except maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I got to visit Gringart's anyway for a Dungledore, uh, Hogwarts business. Hogrid, Hogrid drew himself up proudly. He usually gets me to do important stuff for him. Fetching you, getting things from Grinnerts. Knows he can trust me, see? Got everything? Come on then. Harry followed Hagrid out onto the rock. The sky was quite clear now, and the sea glimmed, uh, gleamed in the sunlight. The boat Uncle uh, Vernon had hired was still there with a lot of water in the bottom of uh, bottom after the storm. How did you get here? Harry asked, looking around for another boat. Flew, said Halgrid. Hagrid. Flew, yeah, but we'll go back in this. Not supposed to use magic now. I've got you. They settled down in the boat, Harry still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though, said Hagrid, giving Harry another of his sideways looks. Sideways looks. If you're to do to speed things up a bit, you'd uh, mind um, not mentioning it to Hogwarts. In, it at Hogwarts, of course not," said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid. Um, pulled out his pink umbrella again, tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off towards land. Why would you be mad to try and rob um, Gringert's? Harry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. They say those dragons guarding the high of security vaults, and then there's got to find. Then you got to find your way. Gringerts is hundreds of miles around London. See, deep under the uh, deep underground, you'll die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on on Summit. Harry sat and thought about this while Hager uh, read his newspaper, the Daily um, Prophet. Harry had learned that Uncle Vernon from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone while they were doing this, but it was very difficult. He'd never had so many questions in his life. Ministry of Magic messing things up as usual, Hogwarts muttered, turning the page. There's a Ministry of Magic? Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hogwarts. They wanted Dumbledore for a minister, of course, but he'd never leave Hogwarts. As old uh, Cor uh, Corey, Corey's fudge um, got the job. Bugler, if ever there was one. So he plot, uh, so he pelts Dungledorp with owls every morning asking for advice. But what does the Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from the Mongols. 
that there's still witches and uh, wizards up and down in the country. Why? Why um, blindly, blindly, Harry, everybody be wanting magic uh, solutions to solve their problems? Nah, they're best left alone. At this moment, the boat bumped gently onto the into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded his paper and they climbed up the stone steps onto the street. Passerbyers stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry couldn't blame them. Not only was uh, Hagrid twice as, as tall as everyone else, he kept pointing to perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, see that, Harry? These thing, things these muggles dream up. Huh. Hagrid, said Harry, pa um, pa uh, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are uh, dragons at uh, Diggards? Griggles? Well, as you say, said Hagrid. Crinkly, I'd like a dragon. You'd like, you'd like one? Wanted one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes time. Hagrid, who uh, didn't understand Muggles' money, as he called it, gave the bills to Harry so he could buy their, their tickets. People stared more than ever at the trains. Uh, on this train. Hagrid took two seats and sat knitting, um, knitting what he what looked like a canary yellow uh, citrus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted his stitches. Harry took the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good, said Hagrid. There's a list there of everything you need. Harry unfolded the second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read. Hagrid's School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First-year students will require three sets of plain working robes, black. One plain pointed hat, black for every for day wear. One pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. One winter cloak, black, silver uh, finishes. Please note that all pupils' clothing should carry name tags. Course books. All students should have a copy of, every, of each of the following. The standard book of spells, grade one. A history of magic. Magical theory. A beginner's guide to transfiguration, 1,000 medical herbs and fungi, and medical drafts and potions, fantasy um, beasts and where to find them, the dark fences, a guide to self-protection, the dark forces, a guide to self-protection. Other equipment. One wand, one cauldron, pewter size, no, standard size two, one set glass or crystal, um, I feel falls. See, the, sometimes, I mean, yeah, as you can see, I've been stumbling over a lot of these words. There are words that we don't normally use. Uh, first of all, it's set off in, um, in London, where they had the the British use different words, um, and a lot of times it's fictional things, so it's okay to stumble over them. Um, you probably will. I know I definitely have been. One telescope, one set of brass scales. Students may also bring an owl or a cat, or a road, or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all these, these, 
this in London? Harry wondered aloud. If you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before. Although Hagrid seemed to know these, he was seemed to know where he was going. He was oddly, obviously not used to getting there in the ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier uh, on the underground and complained loudly that the street, that the seats were too small and the train too slow. I don't know how the Mongols manage without magic, he said, as they climbed the broken down escalator that led up to the bustling road lined with shops. Hagrid was so huge that he um, parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was to keep close behind him. They passed bookshops and music stores, hamburger restaurants and cinemas, but nowhere that looked as if he could sell, any, sell you a magic wand. This was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. Could there really be um, piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath, beneath there? Were there really shops that sold spell books and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke from the Darsleys that had cooked up? If Harry had known that the Darsley had no sense of humor, he might have thought so. Yet somehow, even though everything Hagrid had told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The leaky cauldron is, the, is it's a famous place. It's a tiny, crumbly looking pub. If Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry wouldn't have noticed it. People was hurrying by, didn't glance at all. Their eyes slid from the uh, big bookshop to one side of the record store on the other side as if they couldn't see the leafy, the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry made the the most Harry had the most peculiar feeling that no that only he and Hogwarts could see it. Before he could mention this, Hogwarts had um, steered him inside. For a famous place, it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in the corner drinking uh, tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everybody seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him. And the bartender reached for a glass, saying, "The usual Hogwarts can't, Tom. I'm on, I'm on Hogwarts business," said Hagrid. Hogwarts business. Clapping his giant hand on Harry's shoulder, and um, making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord," said the bartender, peering at Harry. "Is that? Could this be?" The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old bartender. Harry Potter, what an honor. He hurried out from behind the bar, rustled uh, towards Harry, and seized his hands, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter. Welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everybody was looking at him. The old woman with the, woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it has gone out. Hogwarts was beaming. There, then there was a giant scraping, scraping of chairs, and the next moment Harry found himself shaking hands with everybody at the leaky cauldron. Doris Cogford, Mr. Potter, couldn't believe. I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I am just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. I'm all of a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just, um, just can't tell you. Diggly's the name. 
Douglas Digley. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Douglas Dig Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. You, blew, you bowed to me once in a shop. You rem he remembered, cried Diggly, Dig Diggles, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembered me. Harry shook his hand. Sh Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crawford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of the, his eyes was twitching. Professor Quill, said Hogwarts. Harry, Professor Quill will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p Potter, Potter, stammered Professor Quill, gasping Harry's hand. C -c Can't t tell you how p -p -p pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quill? D -d Defense against the d -d -d dark arts, muttered Professor Quill as uh, though he'd rather not think about it. No, no, not that you, you need it. You're a p -p potter, he whispered nervously. You'll be get, getting all your equipment, I suppose. I, I've got, got to p -p pick up new b -b books on vampires my, my, myself. I looked, he looked ter uh, terrified at the very thought. But the others weren't, wouldn't let Professor Quill keep Harry to himself. It took almost 10 minutes to get away from them, all, to get away from them all. At last, Hogarth managed to make himself heard over the bu uh, bumble. Must get on, lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Doris Crock Crockford um, shook Harry's hand one last time and Hogwarts led him through the bar and out into the small walled courtyard where there was nothing but a trash can and a few weeds. Hogwarts grinned at Lake Harry. Told you, didn't I? Um, told you you were famous. Even Professor Quill was trembling to, to meet you. Mind you, he usually is trembling. Is he always that nervous? Uh, yeah. Poor bloke, brilliant mind. He is fine. He was fine while he was studying up um, out of books. But when he took a year off to get some firsthand experience, they say that he met vampires in the Black Forest, and there was a nasty bite of trouble without with a hay. Never been the same sense, scared of, of the students, scared of his own subjects. Now where's my, now where's my umbrella? Vampires? Hags? Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, uh, meanwhile, was counting bricks on the wall bef um, above the trash can. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he'd been touched uh, quivered. It wiggled. In the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, there were facing an, an archway large enough for Hagward, an archway into a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagward to Dre... Uh, Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amusement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into a solid wall. The sun shone brilliantly on the stack, stacks of uh, cauldrons outside the nearby the near shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, bronze, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, and a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you're, you're in need of one, said Halgrid, but we've got to get your money first. Harry wished he had been eight, had been eight more, had eight more eyes. 
He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once, the shops, the things outside of them, the people doing their shopping, a plump link, uh, woman outside, and Ap um, Applicary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragons, dragon livers, 17 shilling, uh, shinkles, an ounce. They're mad. A low, soft um, hooting came from the dark, sh from a dark shop with a sign saying, "All Emporium." Tawny screeched, barn brown and snowy. Several boys of Har uh, Harry's age had their noses pressed into the windows, with broom with broomsticks sticks in it. Look. Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes, and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat uh, spleens and eels, eel eyes, uh, tatter, totterers, piles of spell books, quills and rolls of parchment, potion blend uh, bottles, globes of the moon, got, uh, gringarts, said uh, Hogren. They reached, they reached a snowy white building that towered over all the other shops. Stand beside its um, bar, uh, burnished bronze doors, uh, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold. A uniform of scarlet and gold was. Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hogrid, quickly as they walked up the white stone steps towards him. The goblins are about a head about a short um, about a head shorter than Harry. He had a, a swithering, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with the words engraved upon them. Enter stranger, but take heed of, the, of what awaits the sin of greed, for, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you, if you seek beneath our floors the treasure that is never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding uh, more than treasures there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try to rob it, said Harry Hogren. A pair of goblins bowed, um, bowed, them, bowed them through the silver doors, and they were in the vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were uh, sitting on the high stools behind a, lo a long counter scribing in large ledgers, weighing coins in brass scales, examining pieces, precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off, off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of those. Hogrin and Harry made for the counter. Morning, said Hogrin to a free goblin. We're come to take some money some money out of Mr. Potter, Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have his keys, sir? Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, Hagrid um, as he started uh, exploring his, emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering, scattering a, ha um, a handful of moldy dog biscuits, of, uh, another goblin's book of numbers, a goblin, the goblin, a 
Okay. Sorry, I stumbled upon this. This is, I've been really stumbling. I've got it here somewhere, said Hagar, and he started emptying his pockets into the, onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's books of numbers. The goblin uh, wrinkle, wrinkled his, his nose. Harry watched the goblin on, there, on the right weighing a pile of rubies as big as a glowing coal. Got it, said Hager at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be in order. And I've got and I've also got a letter from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid, importantly throwing out throwing out his chest. It's about the young uh, know what. The it's about the you know what in the vault. 713. The goblin read the number uh, carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will, I will have somebody take you down to the both the vaults. Grip hook, grip hook was yet another goblin. Once um, Hagrid had had, once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back into his pocket, he and Harry followed uh, Grip Hook uh, towards one of the doors leading off to off the hall. What's what's the you know what in Vault Seven Hundred and Thirteen? Harry asked. Can't tell you that," said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret Hogwarts business. Dumbledore trusts trust me. Um, more is my job's worth to tell you that. Grip Hook held the door open for them. Harry, who had been ex expecting more marble, was surprised. There were a narrow stone passageway lit by flaming torches. Its sloping steep it sloped st uh, steeply downward, and there was a little rail railroad tracks on the floor. Grippled whistled, and a small cart came heralding up the tracks towards them. They climbed in. Hagrid, uh, Hagrid, with some difficulty, and they were off. At first, they just hurried through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember, left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Grip Hook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stunned as the cold air reached past them, rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of the passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon, but too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where a huge stalagmites and stalactites grew from the ceiling and, and the floor. I've never, I've never known Harry call to Hagrid over the the noise of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmites uh, got got him in it, said Hagrid. And don't ask me a question just now. I think I'm going to be sick. You don't look very green. He did look very green. And the cart stopped at the last at last beside a small door in the passage wall. Hogger got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees from trembling. Grip Hook unlocked the door and a lot of green smoke came bellowing out of it. And as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze canets. All yours, smiled Hagrid. 
all Harry's? It was incredible. The Dunsley, Dun, the Dunsleys, Darsleys, could have known about all this, or they would have, or they would have had it from, or they would have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry cost them to keep, and all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are gallons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to the goblin and twenty-nine knuts to the sickles. It's easy enough. Right. That should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to uh, Grip Hook. Vault uh, 713 now, please. And can we can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air grew colder and colder as they hurried around tight corners. They were ran, uh, they were rattling over an underground ravine, and Harry leaned over to see to uh, the side to try to see what he what was down in the dark bottom. But Harry groaned, and but Hogwarts groaned and pulled him back um, by the scuff of his neck. Vault seven hundred and thirteen had a keyhole. Stand back," said Griphook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers. And it, se- and it simply melted away. If anyone had, uh, if anybody but a uh, Gringotts goblin had tried, they would, they would be sucked through the door and trapped in there. Said uh, Grip Hook. How often do you check to see if every if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About every ten years, said Grip Hook, with a rather nasty grin. Something really um, extraordinary, but extraordinary, but to be inside this top security vault, Harry was sure, and he learned leaned forward eagerly, expecting to see see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first, he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Harry P- Hogrid picked it up and tucked it inside his coat. Harry longed to know what, was, what it was, but knew better than to ask. Come on back in, uh, come, come on back in the cart and, and don't talk to me. On the way back, it's best if I keep my mouth shut," said Hayward. One wild cart ride, ride, ride later, and they stood blinking in the sunlight outside the Gringotts. Harry could didn't know where to run for. Um, Harry didn't know where to run first. Now that he had a bag full of money, he didn't know how how many. Um, brilliance there are worth to a pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd had in his whole life, more money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get you, your uniform, said Hogrid, nodding towards um, Madam Milliken's robes for all occasion. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slip off for a... a to pick up, making up a leaky cauldron. I hate to, uh, I I hate those uh, Greenhearts carts. He did still look a bit sick. So Harry entered Madame uh, Milliken's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Milliken was a squat, was a squirt, smiling, was a squ- uh, squat, 
smiling witch dressed all in mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said when Harry started to speak. Get the lot there. Another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a, pa with a pale pointed face was standing with a foot on a footstool while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame uh, Milliken uh, stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipping a long robe over his head and began to pin it up right, began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying my books and my and mother's up the street looking for wands, said the boy. He had he had a bored, dro uh, drooling voice. When I'm going to drag, then I'm going to drag them off to look for a racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I, I'll bully father into getting me one and I'll uh, smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strangely reminded of Dudley. Have you got your your own broom? The boy went on. No, said Harry. Play um, Quidditch at all? No, Harry said again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house. And I must say, I agree. Know what house you'll be in? No, said Harry, feeling a little more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really does, really knows until they get there, do they? But I think I'll be in Slytherins. All my families have, have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'll leave, don't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the a boy stum, uh, suddenly, nodding towards the front window. Hogrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and, point, and pointing at two large ice cream cones to show he, he, he couldn't come in. That's Hogrid, Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know some, something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy. I've heard of him. He's sort of a servant, isn't he? He's a gamekeeper. <laughs> ah, great, hey? <laughs> Not only is my reading bad, but then all of a sudden the lights go off. I guess I was just too still. Believe it or not, uh, we're, we're getting there. This is a long chapter. It was like 20 some pages. I'm getting there. I'm stumbling over. Um, if you want to take a, just a break and come back, um, I'll continue to read. But like I said, it's a long chapter. So um, if you want to just pause the computer and then come back, uh, I completely understand. Okay. He's the game games keeper, said Harry. He's like he was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of a of a savage. Lives in a hut on the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk, tries to do magic, and ends up uh, starting fires in it to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you, said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter, into the matter with the boy. Oh, sorry, said, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They are a witch and a wizard, if that's what you mean. 
I really don't think they should should let that they should let the other sort in, do you? They're not they're just not the same. They're not been brought up to know our ways. Some of them had never ever heard of Hogwarts until they get a letter and imagine. I think you should keep it to the old wizard or wizarding families. What's your surname anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame Millicone said, there you done my dear. And Harry, not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped off onto, down from the footstool. Well, I'm sorry, I'll, well, I'm, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drool, drooling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream. Hagrid had, um, had bought for him chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up, said Hagrid. Nothing, Harry lied. They stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry grinned up a bit where, when he found a bottle of ink that changed colors as you wrote. When they had left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's um, uh, Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I kept forgetting how little you know, not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. I told, uh, he told um, Hagrid about the pale boy in Madame Milligan's. And he said people from a Muggles family shouldn't be allowed in. Yet none of the Muggle, Muggles family, you're not from a Muggle family. If he hadn't known who you are, you were, he's grown up knowing your name. If, he, if his parents are wizard folks, you saw that, you saw that what everybody at Lucky, uh, Leaky Cauldron was, was like when they uh, saw you. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I have ever seen saw came, uh, were the only ones with magic in them. A long line of muggles. Look at your mom. Look what she had for a sister. So what is uh, Quidditch? It's our sport, wizard sport. It's like like saucer, like uh, soccer in Muggle world, everybody follows Quidditch. Played up, played up in this air on broomsticks, and there is four balls. Sorta hard to explain the rules. And what, what are um, Slytherins and Hufflepuff? Hufflepuff. Schoolhouses. There's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff is a lot of. Um, duffles, dufflers, but I bet I'm a huffle, Hufflepuff, said Harry grimly. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. There's not, not a single witch or wizard who, want, who, want, uh, who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Well, sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts? Um, years and years ago, said Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. They bought Harry school books. They bought Harry school books in a shop called Flourish and Blutters, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books at the large looks as large as a paving stone um, bound in leather, books the size of postage stamps, in covers of silk, books filled with peculiar, peculiar symbols, and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to see to get his hands on some of those. Hogwarts always, almost had to drag Harry away from the um, curse and counter, counter curse, 
which um, bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest re um, revengers, hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tires, and much, much more by Professor v <coughs> Vildurus Vildura. I'm trying to find out how to uh, curse Dudley. I'm not, tr I'm not saying that that's a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the model world, except in very special circumstances, said Hayward. In any way, you can't work any of them curse, and you can't work any of the curses yet. You'll never, you'll need a lot more studying before you, you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry, Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on, on our list, but they got a nice set of scales for weights, for weighing potions, ingredients, and a collapsible brass telescope. Uh, then they visited the um, apothecary, which was um, fantasizing enough to make up for the horrible smell, a mixture of bad eggs and rotten cabbage. Barrels of sl uh, slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dry, dried roots, and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung on the ceiling, while Harold Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for, for a supply of some base, basic potions ingredients for Harry. Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at 21 gal, galleons each, a um, minuscule glimmering black beaded eyes, five canuts a scoop. Outside, the Harry Hogrid um, checked Harry's list again. Just your wand left. It, yeah, uh, I still haven't got you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get your animal. Not a toad. Toads were out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're, uh, they're dead, useful, carrying your mail and everything. 20, uh, 20 minutes later, they left Ipaloop's Owl Emporium which had been dark and full of ruddling uh, and flutterings. Jewel bright eyes, Harry carried a large cage that held a beautiful snowy owl. Fast asleep with his head under the wing, he couldn't stop, uh, he couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding like, the profess like Professor Quill. Don't mention it, said Hagrid uh, gruffly. Don't expect you'd, you'd had a lot of presents from the Darsleys. Just a flanderer's left now. On, only place for wands. A flanderer's, and you got to have the best one. A magic wand? This was what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read, of oh, oh, Flandelers, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tiny, a tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spiral um, spindly chair that Hogwarts sat on 
uh, to wait. Harry felt stranger, strangely, as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new, of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes lying neatly tight on, up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to be tickly, tickly with some magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped, and Hogrid must have jumped too, because there was a lar loud uh, crunching noise, and he got quickly off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was here herself, buying her first wand, ten and a quarter inches long, wishily made a whip a willow. Wish wishy made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Oliphant Fander uh, moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were, were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches. Pliable. A little more powder and an excellent for transfigurations. Well, I say your father favored it. It's really the one that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Oliphander had come so close that Harry, that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes, and that's where Mr. Oliphander touched the lightning scar of Harry's on his Harry's forehead with a long, thin finger. I'm sorry to say. I sold the one that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. Yeah, powerful wand, very, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going to do to the world. Harry shook his head, and he shook his head, and then to Harry's relief, spotted Hogrid. Rubus. Rubus Hogwood, how nice to see you again. Oak, 16 inches. Rather um, bendy, it, bendy, isn't it? It was, sir, yes. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Y yes, they did, yes, said Hog um, Hagrid. Shuffling to his, his feet. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said um, Ollivander sharply. Ah, yes, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Uh, Harry noticed he gri gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let's see. He pulled a long tape measure from sil with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold your arms. Hold out your arms. That's it. He measured Harry's from shoulders to fingers, then wrist to elbow, shoulders to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. And as he measured, he said, even every Oliphander's wand has a core of powerful ma uh, magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hair, phoenix tail feathers, and a, a heartstring of dragons. 
No two Ollivander wands are the same, just one, just as no two unicorns, dragons, and phoenixes are the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry son, suddenly realized the tape, that the tape measure, which was measuring um, between his nostrils, was was doing it on its own. Mr. Ollivander was fitting, was flitting around the shelves, um, taking down boxes. That will, that will do, he said, and the tape measure crumbled into a heap on the floor. All right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Benchwood and dragon um, heartstrings, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just uh, take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and feeling foolish, foolish, waved it around a bit. But Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feathers, seven inches, quite whippy for try. Harry tried, but he had hardly raised the wand when it too was snatched back from Mr. Ollivander. No, no. Here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on and try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander piled on the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, huh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect want match. Here somewhere, I wonder now. Yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix feathers, 11 inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head and brought its um, switching down through the dusty air and a stream of red and, and gold sparks shot from the end like fireworks, throwing a dancing spot of light on, onto the walls. Hogrid whooped and clapped and all fender cried. Oh, bravo, yes indeed. Oh, very good, well, well, well. How curious, how very curious. He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it up in brown paper, still muttering, curious, curious. Sorry, said Her Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Oliphander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand, it so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather it is in your wand gave another feather, just one. It was very curious indeed that you should be uh, uh, disdained from this wand uh, when its brother, that you should be disdained for this, destined for this wand when its brother, why its brother gave you that scar. Harry's, uh, swallowed. Yes, 13 and a half inches. Yeah, curious indeed. How these things happen. A wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think I must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who, no, who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Alflander too, too much. He paid seven gold uh, galleys for his wand, and Mr. Alflander bowed, bowed, um, bowed them from their shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Holgren made their way uh, down the uh, Diagon Diag Alley. Back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron. 
now empty, Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how, mu how much people were gawking at them on the underground. Laden, laden as they were with all their funny shaped packages, with the snowy owl asleep in the cage on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into the um, pattering station, Harry only realized where they were when um, Hogwarts tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before the train leaves, he says. He bought Harry a hamburger, and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. Are you all right, Harry? You're very quiet, said Hogwarts. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed his hamburger, trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quill, the uh, Mr. Olive, Olive, Ollivander, but I don't know anything about magic at all. How could they expect great things? I'm famous, and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when, well, sorry, I know the name, the night my parents died. Hogwart leaned across the table, behind the wild beard and eyebrows. He wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you're here. You'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. I still do. Smarter, in fact. Hogwarts helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dillsbury when he handed them him an envelope. Your ticket to Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, uh, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. She, um, see you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry um, watched a... Uh, so Harry wanted to watch Hogrid until it was he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window. But he blinked and Hogrid was gone. Okay. Um, I'm done with chapter five. It was a long one. And I know chapter six is also a long one. So I'll be back this afternoon. But as you... Remember, there's a lot of problems, and Voldemort, um, Voldemort is still popping up. Uh, you know, his name was mentioned several times, so I'm thinking that he's going to come back throughout the whole story. Um, so I'll see you for the next chapter.